It is a cold, dark night in the town of Alexandria. The open streets of what is typically a bustling town stand abandoned, covered in a thick layer of powdery snow and ice. What began this afternoon as a gentle flurry has since swelled into a howling blizzard. The only visible form of light comes by way of raised oil lamps glowing softly from above. The streets are silent, save for the ever-present screech of the winds. Suddenly, a new sound begins to echo from the northern end of town. What begins as a soft, jingling sound quickly gives way to the jostling and clanging of metal, interspersed with pained grunts and gasping breaths. A small troop of men and women round the corner, their ragged frames engaged in a full sprint. They stumble through the snow as they run, straining to breathe in the frozen air. Several clutch at open wounds, their swords caked with frozen red gore. One of them stops, mid-sprint, and points to one of the buildings, an abandoned tavern. Not hesitating, the group rushes inside, out of the biting wind. As the last of them enter, one of their number closes the door as swiftly yet softly as they can. Their bodies beaten, and their lungs frozen, the members of the group gather close, pressing their bodies against the wall and door that leads back to the streets, crouching as low as they can. For a few moments, only the howling of the wind can be heard. Then, the moans begin. First one, then another, then several dozen. No one moves. The moans swell in volume as their source grows closer to the tavern. Still, no one moves. The group holds their position for several minutes, their weapons at the ready, as the moans pass in front of their position. Eventually, the moans subside. For several more minutes, the group remains motionless. None dare risk drawing attention to themselves. Eventually, the tension becomes too much to bear as one of the party gently pulls themselves to one knee. Arm trembling, they reach for the tarp hung over one of the windows, and, nodding to their companions, gently begin to peel it back. They stumble backwards as the tarp falls, resisting the urge to scream out in terror. A new sound begins to echo from just outside the tavern. Singing. Soft. Gentle. Haunting. Singing. The moans resume. The horde is coming. Ah, undead. We can't live without them, and they can't live. From the lowly zombie to the terrifying lich. These shambling horrors have made their mark across fantasy and history alike, across many different cultures and time periods. Undead have featured heavily in horror stories, urban legends, and religious passages, sparking our imaginations and fueling our nightmares. With such a deep pool of lore to pull from, it's no surprise that Undead have also found themselves a strong place amongst the monsters of Dungeons and Dragons. Hey everyone, I'm Ryu, and on this episode of Monster Madness, we're going to be talking about Undead. We'll cover what exactly Undead are, the various categories of Undead, how to use Undead, and how you can create a few dark apparitions of your own. What are undead? The term undead, by definition, refers to a creature that is animate while deceased. Whether the undead in question has a physical body has no bearing on this term. In D&D, undead are almost always created through the use of necromancy. In real-world legends, necromancy is a type of magic commonly used to manipulate or communicate with the dead. D&D is similar in this regard, but with a few changes. Most D&D lore cites necromancy as the manipulation of the life force, whether it be through harmful effects, the creation of new undead, or even resurrecting the dead. Spells like Revivify or Resurrection are technically classified as necromancy, because even if you're not bringing the target back as a corpse, you're still bringing them back from the dead. 
Curses can also be a form of necromancy, and are how you get things like ghosts or vampires. Basically, if it can affect the mortal world while deceased, it's an undead. Even monsters that once belonged to a different creature type entirely still qualify as undead if they fit this criteria. So things like Draculiches or zombified versions of monstrosities are still treated as undead by the D&D rules, and have the benefits slash weaknesses that come with undead. Whether or not these creatures maintain the benefits slash weaknesses of their previous creature type is up to you. The Types of Undead It may seem trivial, describing the different types of undead. After all, I think we're all familiar with zombies, ghosts, vampires, etc. But knowing the origin of different creatures can provide some fun inspiration for games. I'll also touch a bit on what sets the D&D versions of these undead apart from their non-D&D counterparts. And I'll stress in advance that you don't need to follow what I say in this segment word for word. My goal here is to summarize the information found across D&D lore. But, as I've said before, it's up to you to decide how the different creatures and systems of D&D fit into your campaign. If zombies being the result of a virus is something you prefer, feel free to make that the case in your game. Zombies, Skeletons, and Other Corpses There's no one agreed historical origin for zombies. In Greece, we've discovered ancient graves in which rocks and other heavy materials were placed atop the remains of the deceased, supposedly to keep them from rising. In various parts of West Africa, Haiti, and the American South, zombies were believed to be created through the practice of voodoo by practitioners called Bokor. Cinema and other media like to portray voodoo as some evil magic, but in actuality, voodoo is a religion, and has almost nothing to do with the evil ritual seen in books or films. Those demonic chants and dolls full of needles are mostly Hollywood tropes. In modern forms of popular media such as TV shows or video games, zombies or other types of walking corpses are typically the result of some form of virus. Their existence is more backed up by science as opposed to something supernatural. This idea was first popularized in the 1968 film Night of the Living Dead. It's where we get our idea of the modern zombie, this shambling corpse bent on consuming living flesh. As we covered earlier, in D&D, zombies, like other undead, are created through necromancy. The exact source of that necromancy is up to you, as D&D lore typically leaves room for the DM to put their own spin on things. Now, the only known player methods for creating undead like skeletons or ghouls is by way of a small handful of spells, like Animate Dead for zombies and skeletons, or Create Undead for ghouls. This is mostly for mechanical reasons, as an ability that lets a player create their own Death Knight would basically throw power balance out the window. For villains, though, anything goes. Those evil necromancers need to get their skeleton minions from somewhere. Apparitions This category basically encompasses all incorporeal undead, from run-of-the-mill ghosts, to banshees, to will-o'-wisps. There are several historical origins for most of the apparitions in D&D, and many of the names for said apparitions, like Wraith, Spectre, or Poltergeists, are defined differently from setting to setting, or mythology to mythology, though the names associated with these creatures do have defined origins, like how the word Banshee roughly translates to Fairy Woman in Old Irish, and was used for a female apparition that wept, or wailed, to herald the death of a family member. The origins and powers of these creatures have been altered to suit the loose mythology of D&D, much like creatures from any creature type. In the Banshee's case, the Fey origins were probably converted to Elven to keep with the theme, and the Wailing was changed to be more of an attack rather than a warning to make the Banshee more fun to fight. Couldn't tell you where the whole pretty woman who failed to use her beauty for good thing comes from. It just seems to be one of those sexist fantasy tropes that were all too common in the early days of D&D. Maybe it's part of a lesser-known legend involving banshees? I'm not really sure. <coughs> Anyways, most apparitions tend to have pretty similar power sets. They're incorporeal, they're resistant to non-magical weaponry, and they can drain the life force from their victims. 
The more powerful apparitions have the ability to possess living bodies, and even create new apparitions. They're also immune to most harmful status effects, like being knocked prone or being stunned. Apparitions are primarily created through curses, intentional or otherwise. They could be raised as part of a ritual, or, one of my favorites, through emotion. In a lot of old stories, apparitions are often portrayed as vengeful spirits, or beings consumed by grief. In a few rare cases, apparitions will be a force for good, acting as protectors of some special location, or even functioning as heralds, seeking to prevent the living from suffering the same fate as themselves. There's always a story behind these apparitions. There's always a reason behind their actions, whether they be benevolent or malevolent. A ghost who was murdered alongside their loved ones, and now seeks revenge. Or a wraith who was brought so much grief and frustration at their own death that they can't move on to the afterlife. Apparitions give you a lot to work with as a DM. Powerful Undead Weird method of assortment, I know. But appropriate here, I feel. This category basically encompasses the undead that are either too powerful or too unique to place into any one category. Things like death knights, vampires, and liches fall here. These undead are rarely created accidentally, and if they are, it likely still involves powerful necromancy. These are the undead with ambitions, with minions of their own, the undead who make imposing big bads for adventures or even whole campaigns. In many cases, these creatures became undead willingly. Death Knights, for example, are paladins who willingly broke their sacred oaths, while Liches are powerful wizards who became undead as part of a warped desire for immortality. Many undead in this category actually originated with D&D. The term Lich is technically just a word for corpse, but it was Gary Gygax who associated Lich with the idea of this evil undead mage. This doesn't mean you can't come to your own conclusions for how these creatures are created, though. Maybe vampires in your setting are created through a special selection process, like in World of Darkness. Or maybe Death Knights are the chosen heralds of Lord Soth, another popular D&D figure who was also a Death Knight. The choice is up to you. How to use Undead Undead are a DM's best friends. Whether your players are exploring the classic underground dungeon, scoping out a creepy cemetery, or even just traveling through the wilderness. The undead's crumbling frames and haunted origins leave no mystery as to why they're one of the most popular creature types. This also makes them one of the easiest creature types to deploy. If your players encounter a group of skeletal soldiers patrolling the halls of an abandoned castle, they'll jump into initiative, no questions asked. But, as I talked about earlier, many undead, apparitions especially, can have stories woven around their deaths. What type of equipment are the skeletons wearing? What did the apparition look like? How long have they been patrolling this place? And for what reason? All dungeons, regardless of what form they take, have a history behind them. This abandoned keep wasn't always abandoned, and these undead weren't always undead. Encountering undead outside a dungeon can be interesting as well. Ghouls are one of my favorite examples. Unlike the Monster Manual version of zombies, ghouls are specifically stated to be consumers of flesh. So where there are ghouls, there must also be cadavers. Has there been a plague? A military invasion? Maybe the ghouls spawned from a marezi, a demon with the ability to create new ghouls. Powerful undead almost always have extensive stories behind them, which is one of the reasons they make such great villains. Going back to one of my favorites, the Death Knight. These guys are described as paladins who broke their oath. They have a CR of 17, which implies that they weren't just paladins, but powerful paladins. How did they break their oath, and for what reason? What are their goals? Or who did they serve in their undeath? Do they operate alone, or do they command a horde of lesser undead? Undead, just by their existence, always tell a story. I think that's what makes them so great. Homebrewing Undead Undead can be a little tricky to homebrew, mostly because they either already cover their respective themes very well, or because many of them already have stronger or weaker versions, like how vampires are split into master vampires and vampire thralls. So we'll have to think a little more outside the box this time. Same as last time, we'll start by modifying an already existing undead, after which we'll create a unique undead of our own. 
For our modified creature, we'll use a wraith. The monster manual tells us that wraiths are malice incarnate. They're infused with negative energy and basically sap the life force out of plants and other small creatures just by being in the vicinity. Their stat block tells us that they're fast, have a decent amount of health, and can reduce a creature's max HP by draining the life force out of them. They can also touch a recently dead humanoid and transform them into a specter. For our homebrew, let's capitalize on that anger that fuels a wraith. We'll leave pretty much everything north of special powers alone for now. Most of the wraith's speeds and resistances are universal for any incorporeal undead. For special powers, we'll start by giving the wraith a necrotic aura. Their description talks about how they sap the life force from nearby creatures. But the fact that it's not represented in the stat block leads me to believe that it's not typically powerful enough to deal damage. We'll fix that by stealing an ability from the Bodak, Aura of Annihilation. Any creature that starts its turn within a certain radius of the Wraith takes necrotic damage. Now let's do something about that whole Malice Incarnate thing. Infectious Malice. The Wraith targets a creature within 30 feet who must make a Charisma save. On a failed save, the target goes berserk and has to use its next turn to move and attack the creature closest to it. If they aren't close enough to attack anything, they must instead attack themselves. I'm going with Charisma as opposed to Wisdom here, since this is a more emotional-based power. And Charisma saves don't happen nearly enough. This ability recharges on a 5 or a 6 on a d6. Let's make one last power. Frenzy. If the Wraith falls below half HP, it goes berserk and can make an additional life drain attack on each of its turns. Actions will leave mostly alone, save for one thing. The Wraith can make one life drain attack and uses its infectious malice if it can. That way, it doesn't waste its entire turn if infectious malice fails. Scrolling back to the top of the stat block, we'll give it five more hit dice to compensate for the higher damage output. Speed will remain the same. A Wraith already has a flying speed of 60 feet, so there's no real reason to change it here. We'll increase the Wraith's dexterity to 20 and its con to 18, which in tandem will raise its AC and max HP, but will drop its intelligence, wisdom, and charisma significantly, flavoring this as a Wraith that's completely given in to its anger and is no longer capable of communicating which would also remove any languages the Wraith knew. Finally, we'll give it immunity to the Frightened condition. This thing only knows anger and hatred now. And there we go, the Berserk Spirit, a deadlier version of a Wraith that has been consumed by its own hatred and no longer possesses the ability to think or reason. Okay, now to create an undead from scratch. Side note, the process of homebrewing can differ from person to person, so do these things in whatever order works best for you. The first choice is corporeal or incorporeal. We just did an incorporeal creature with the wraith, so for this, we'll say corporeal. Environment isn't really important here, since undead can show up pretty much anywhere. We should now ask ourselves, why is this creature an undead? What happened while it was mortal that left it shunned from the afterlife? I've had this idea for an armored figure whose lust for battle has kept it fighting past death. Kind of in the same realm as a sword wraith, but driven more by sport than glory. It walks in a suit of blackish red plate armor, its form stained red with the blood of its victims. For size, we'll go with medium. This was once a humanoid, like an elf or a dwarf. It's heavily armored, but not slow, so its walking speed will be 30 feet. Ability scores will come later, after we've established its attacks and powers. For saves, this undead will have strength and constitution, like a fighter or a barbarian. Damage immunities, poison and necrotic, typical for many undead. Damage resistances, non-magical damage. The necromancy fueling this thing is strong. Condition immunities, exhaustion, frightened, and poisoned. Again, typical. Save for Frightened, but this thing is after combat and combat only. No way it's being scared off. For Senses, just Dark Vision out to 60 feet, nothing fancy. Languages, whatever it knew in life, but it doesn't speak. It doesn't care about diplomacy anymore. Now for Powers. 
This thing has magic resistance. Only strong physical damage can truly harm this undead. You basically need to give it what it wants. A fight. Let's borrow the Brute ability from Bugbears. Its weapon attacks inflict an extra dice of base damage. We'll give it the Reckless ability, like what Barbarians have. Self-preservation is not this thing's priority. It'll basically have one magical ability. The equivalent of the Compelled Duel spell. It can force someone to attack it. We'll also give it Turning Defiance. It's resistant to effects that turn undead. Finally, Regeneration. This creature regains 10 HP at the start of its turns if it's not at max hit points. Radiant damage disrupts this ability. Now we come to actions. We'll start with multi-attack. This creature can make three Great Axe attacks per turn. It was a deadly combatant, even in life. Its Great Axe functions as a plus one weapon and inflicts an extra D12 worth of acid damage on a hit as the steaming blood coating its axe seeps into the wounds of its prey. You can swap this damage out for Necrotic if you like, but I like the idea of acidic blood. That, and I don't think the acid damage type is used nearly enough. Finally, we'll add an AoE ability, Bloody Cleave. The undead swings its axe in a horizontal arc, cleaving its foes while spraying them with gore. Creatures within a 15-foot square must make a dex save, suffering 3d12 slashing damage plus 2d12 acid damage on a failed save, or half as much on a success. I'm using a square because I don't think a cone would represent the arc of an axe very well, and would be a little too restrictive. Now we go back to the top of the stat block. We'll give this undead an AC of 19. Its armor is plus one. It'll have 16 hit dice. It can take as much punishment as it gives. We now just need to assign the ability scores as we see fit. This creature is a beast in melee combat, but isn't the most intelligent or social. Beast as in strong, not, not beast as in the creature type beast. That's a different video. Finally, we assign its challenge rating. CR with powerful creatures like this is tricky to pin down without extensive playtesting, so I'll go with 13. This undead is something that a tier 3 party encounters. And we are done. The Blood Knight. A fallen warrior who roams the land in silence, only reacting to sentient life against whom it may wet its blade. Side note, if the players kill this thing, but you don't want them taking its weapons or armor, you can always just rule that they're cursed, or unusable by anybody but the Blood Knight. Undead have been a favorite creature type since D&D's inception, and probably aren't losing their popularity anytime soon. I hope this video has inspired you to create some undead of your own. They might not draw breath themselves, but they're certainly a great way to breathe life into your campaign. I'll see myself out. I hope you all enjoyed this episode of Monster Madness. Two creature types down, only 12 to go. Well, at least I won't be running out of material anytime soon. As per usual, I publish things on DMs Guild on the first Saturday of every month. This week's content is The Call of the Wild, 12 Bestial Subraces. Like everything I publish, it's pay what you want. Till next time, happy gaming.